the church and what she's supposed to be. And we look at the very, very beginning of time. I shouldn't say beginning of time. But if we go all the way back to the Old Testament, when we look at God's people, they were in this world, as Jesus said in John chapter 17, but they were not of this world. Abraham got called out. His dad was an idol maker. Right in the middle of pagan worship. But God called Abraham out to be separate. We see the Israelites. When he called them out of Egypt, they were to be separate. They, when we, God talked to Abraham concerning the future generations, they were supposed to be separate. They were in this world, but they were not of this world. And when we look at the church, that is exactly what she's supposed to be. When we look at the church, we see that it is not founded like every other religion or one particular man, but it was founded upon the God-man, Jesus Christ. That man that God looked for, that the man that God looked I'll get it right one this time. The man that Job looked for, who was worthy to put his hand on God's shoulder, but yet at the same time be able to put his hand on Job's shoulder. That go-between, the one that is worthy. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, the prophets and the apostles make up the foundation, and then we build upon on that. We saw that there's three main things when it comes to the church, what her mission is, evangelism, edification of the saints, and education of the saints. As we progressed, we started talking about the gifts that Christ gave to the church, and that's where we're at now. We talked about apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, and how when you look at the office of pastor teacher, the pastor is supposed to be a teacher, but not every teacher is to be a pastor. And now we get down with today, to today when we start talking about the gifts of healing. When we look at the church world today, if you look at ministers or people that want to be in ministry, there's one thing that if you look, they probably most of them want. And it's not just a ministry, but everyone wants a title. They don't want to do anything, but they want a title. They want to be a, a hot show, and we can all probably relate to people that we know or have known in the past that they wanted the head position, but they never did anything. All they wanted was the title. They wanted the position for the glory, the recognition that came with it. They wanted the pat on the back, but they never wanted to do the work. When we look at the church world, the same thing is true. Everybody wants a title. Everybody wants to be a pastor. Everybody wants to be an evangelist. If they're not a pastor, so-and-so, or evangelist, so-and-so, they want to be known as reverend, so-and-so. Um, if you look at the apostolics, practically every ministry you see is a bishop, so-and-so. Everyone wants a title. Everyone wants the position, of le the leadership position, without the responsibility. I shouldn't say everyone, but a lot of people. And when they get in that position, what do they do? They delegate. They delegate. Well, you realize that management, you have to delegate. Yes, I realize there's such a thing as delegation, but that doesn't mean you delegate everything while you sit on your butt and do nothing. There is a place for delegation, and there's a place for you to do something. I get all that. But everybody wants the leadership position, but they don't want the responsibility that that comes with it. But God's church does not need people that are just looking for a title. We realize, yes, God does say that there's the office of the pastor. There is the office of the apostle. But there's responsibility that comes with it. There are obligations that come with it. And, you know, we don't realize the great responsibility that comes with it because, guess what? On judgment day, they're the ones that have to give account. To whom much is given, much is required. But... God's church doesn't need a people that are looking for a title. God gives titles and God places people in position, but people don't need to be looking for these. What God's looking for are willing hands. That's all God's looking for. We've heard the phrase before, God does not call all the qualified, but he qualifies the call. Why? Because those that are qualified, oh, I can do this, or I can do that, and they don't rely upon God. Or I, don't, I can do it this way, and I can do it that way. They lose God in the process. But the person who is dependent upon God and is willing to let God use them, that's what God equips. There are plenty of men and women throughout the Bible that if we looked at and probably studied them out, they weren't eligible for the position that God put them in. 
but God still saw fit to put that person in that position for that time. So what are we talking about today? Um, and someone would please read 1 Corinthians 12, 28. We're going to have to go back to lesson. I just realized I missed the gifts of healing, but today we're going to be talking about helps. So when we look at it, God is looking for people that are willing to work. What are helps? Helps are those people, they don't have a title. They aren't called to that position, but simply they're willing. And when they say, Lord, use me in whatever way you see fit, they mean it from the bottom of their hearts. And when they say, Lord, even if it means scrubbing the toilets, they are the ones that mean, Lord, I'll clean the bathroom. I'll do the behind the works. I'll do behind the scenes work where no one even notices me. If no one even notices what I do, God, I'm willing to do it for you. That is what we're talking about. People that are willing to help in the ministry in whatever capacity. God is, God said to pray for laborers, not titles. If someone would look, uh, read Luke chapter 10 and verse 2. Luke 10, 2. God's vehicle. 
when it comes to the church, if they're cleaning the toilets, if they're patching up walls, if they're collecting the trash. They're not doing it for recognition. They're not doing it because it needs done at the church, per se, but they're doing it, it needs done. This is God's. I'm going to do my best to take care of it. So when we're looking at health, they do everything from cleaning trash, visiting, uh, cleaning up the toilets. They are the ones that do the menial tasks. They are the ones that maybe they make sure the often place get taken from the back to where they belong in every service that nobody sees. Whether it's the pulpit, whether it's the podium, whatever. They are the ones that empty the dehumidifiers. They are the ones that take care of meals. They are the ones that maybe if somebody they know is sick and in the hospital, they just get up and they go and visit them. They are the ones that maybe if somebody's at home and they are feeling down, maybe they just swing by to share some words of encouragement. They are the ones that see things that need done, and they do it. Maybe they are the ones that go around and help visit the widows or the shut-ins. Maybe they realize, hey, the pastor's busy, he works a full-time job. I can swing by the nursing home, so and so to the nursing home. I'll just swing by, see how they're doing, and let them know that we have that, are, that they're not forgiving God. So the helps are the ones that go and do the menial tasks. In part, this is where we see the office of the deacons slow uh, being created for to some degree. Why was the office of the deacons created? Do you remember? I think it's Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 7. Should be the very beginning. Yes, sir. But when we get to the office of the deacon, there's a specific reason they were created, that office was created in the first place, and it is six. And verse one states that in those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministry. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them, and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So basically, the reason the office of the deacon was created in the first place kind of goes along with what we were talking about today. Because there was a need, there was a help that was needed. We find the Grecians are murmuring that, hey, our widows are being neglected. They can't get out. And the apostles, they can't get to them. They're not visiting them the way they're supposed to be. And the response was, so the apostles could stay studying in the word of God and prayer, they created the office of the deacon. Does that not sound like kind of a help to some degree? I know it kind of falls into the government category, but there was a need, so that office was created. God, when we're talking about helps, we're looking at things that need done in the church. Things that you're not going to be publicly recognized for. Things that no one may ever know you did in the first place. But these are all things that need done. Visiting the widows and the shut-ins. Those who help minister in the menial task, as we've already said. Um, empty dehumidifiers, collecting the trash, cleaning the toilets, making things uh, making sure things are in order. You, know, you come by and you see some books out of place on a few pews, just quickly going through, making sure they're in place. No. Menial tasks. This is what help, these are what the helps do. And when we look at even the Apostle Paul, he had helps, he had helpers. What about Priscilla and Aquila? If someone would please read Romans chapter 16 and verse 3. Romans 16, 3. said to bring Priscilla and Aquila his what? His helpers in Christ Jesus. So even the Apostle Paul had helpers with his ministry. 
Our vein was mentioned in Romans 16.3, if I'm not mistaken, as well. I have it in my notes, or else I messed up in my notes. I messed up in my notes. But our vein helped Paul when we look at Silas, he's probably one of the more famous um, helpers that we know with the Apostle Paul because he traveled places he went, you know, in the ministry. We know that he was in prison with Paul for the sake of the ministry. So being a helper is not always a glamorous job, but you might find yourself in a location you never thought you'd be in. But Silas ended up in prison with the Apostle Paul. We look at Timothy, and if we look at Timothy chapter 1 and, and verses 1 through 3, if someone would please that one as well. Uh, I can't speak this morning. First Timothy 1, th chapter, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, if someone would please read that. Paul, the Apostle Jesus Christ, our commandment of God, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, my own son, in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, and sought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I met in the Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some of some that they teach no other doctrine. So when we look at Timothy, we see that he was a helper of Paul, whether he passed the church at Ephesus or whether he was an overseer of several of the churches at Ephesus. Timothy was a helper of Paul. We look at even John Mark, he's not in our notes, but there was a point where Paul sent John Mark away, but there's a verse in the Bible that says, bring John Mark because he is profitable to me for the ministry. Paul had helpers. Even when it comes to these letters, did Paul hand deliver all these letters that he wrote in the New Testament? Because when we look at the epistles of Paul, a lot of them are letters to certain churches. Did Paul deliver all these letters personally? No. Did he send them via email? No. So how did they get there? Helpers. Somebody had to take it there. In fact, in Romans, and I don't have that one in my notes either, but in the book of Romans, the book of Romans was actually delivered by Phoebe. And Phoebe is described as a servant when it comes to her position. It says, Phoebe, a servant, and I can't remember, so God, I should have wrote it down. But when we look at Phoebe, she's a lady who not all, she had a position at church. If you study out Phoebe, she was actually a deaconess. But yet, at the same time, she was also one of Paul's helpers. She delivered the letter to the book of Rome, uh, to the Romans for Paul especially. And we can just go right down the list. Now, if we look at the church world today, even our own church, you know, our own church, there are helpers are that, that are needed in our own church. There, it takes people to run the sound system. It takes people to encourage others. It takes helpers to pray for other people. You know, that in itself, yes, it's something that we're committed to do as Christians, but that is one way that we can be a helper. You know, somebody is being down, well, we can go and we can pray with them. We can pray for them in our in our daily prayers. We can help clean the church. If there are things that need fixed around the church, we can do that, whether it's mowing grass or so forth. But then there's also life guides as well. If someone would please read Titus 2.4. Titus 2.4. young women. Who's being commanded here to do this? Us old women. But the older people are supposed to help teach the younger people. Here specifically it's mentioned that the older ladies help the younger ladies. Should the th same thing not be true of the gentlemen? Should not the older gentlemen grant wisdom and knowledge to the younger ones as well to help guide us in our own way? When we look at the church, We need life guides as well. There is a multitude and a plethora of 
different areas that we need helpers in. And it takes us saying, Lord, here am I, use me. But there also becomes a point in time where we realize, you know what, I'm not going to be around forever. And I can do as much in the church as possible to be a helper. I can take care of this and this and this and this. And the list could go on and on and on and on. But who's going to do it when we're gone? You know, none of us are promised tomorrow. We need to start training our young people to be helpers as well. Not that we have bad young people. We really don't. But it's a matter of training them to have that mindset. I need something done. And it's not one of those... Oh, I can have somebody. Should this be done? It's a matter of seeing something and just doing it. And by doing that, and having them train that they realize that we're not doing it for fame, we're not doing it for glory, we're not even doing it for recognition, but we're doing it for God. I think we'll be surprised not only on that day, on that day, not only who enters into heaven, but who gets rewards and who don't. I think there are going to be a lot of lay people who are maybe getting more rewards than the ministers because the ministers didn't do what they were supposed to behind the pulpit. They didn't love on the people. They didn't go out. They held a position, and that's what they did. They held a position. They collected a paycheck. But there's going to be those who were helpers in the church that, you know what, out of the abundance of our heart, God, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to pick up the trash. I'm going to clean the um for this. I'm going to vacuum. I'm going to make sure this is taken care of. I'm going to make sure that's taken care of. I think we're going to be surprised on that day who gets what who doesn't. But we need to make sure that we're also passing this on to the next generation. Because we need to raise up a generation of Christians that don't go by just society, but the, not what is all about me, but what can I do for God? To go back to JFK, we need to look for people that can say, it's not what my church can do for me, but it's what I can do for my church. Or it's not about what God can do for me, but it's about what I can do for my God. And give them that mentality and train them, because reality is, we're not all going to be around forever. And it doesn't matter of our age. We could a kill over in the next 30 seconds, or plane crash into this place, car accident going home. There could be a plethora of things that happen to us. But are we preparing the next generation to step up? Are we equipping them to take care of the church? Because I'll tell you what, if we can raise up a generation of helpers, then God can raise up a generation of ministers like this world has never been. Because where does the, well, how, I shouldn't say where will a true effective minister start, but when it comes to ministry, if the minister can start on the level of a helper, and their heart is pure and clean before God, their ministry is going to be so much more than that person who just inherited the position or just got it because they were famous or something, and they're just sitting there. Because that person who was trained to be a helper can do so much more for the kingdom of God and is willing to do so much more because they've already learned what it is to be a servant. If you, don't, if you can't be a servant, you really can't be an effective leader. And the thing is, secular world will tell you that. I've had training at my workplace that taught you how to be a servant leader, push you to try to be a servant leader. You have any idea how many servant leaders I've seen in leadership since I've been there? Probably not. Very little. But if we can instill that in our young people, if we can raise them up to be helpers, there is nothing that they won't do for God because their priorities will be straight. Because I'm not doing this for fame or glory. I'm not doing this for recognition. I'm doing this for God. And when they do it for that reason, guess what? When God raises them up, the pulpit, their ministry, is never going to be about themselves. It's always going, it should, for the most part, it's probably going to be God-oriented because that's been instilled with them from little on up. It's one thing for us to get up and us to preach about uh, God said to Isaiah, um, where's our man to stand in the gap and the Lord here I am, here I am send me. That's great. We need to stand in the gap. But we also need to raise up the next generation to be willing to stand in the gap. Because when we pass away, who's going to be standing in that gap? 
You realize that Elijah never selected somebody to take under his wing? Never had somebody that helped him in the ministry who did the helping aspect of it? Because when we look at Elijah, that's exactly what he did for how many years under Elijah? He was the help. He was the one that cleaned up the dishes. He was the one that um, took care of the clothing and washing the clothing, making sure that everything was taken care of. That was Elisha. That wasn't Elijah. That was Elisha. But Elijah took him under his wing. And for how many years Elisha was there? Elijah was standing in the gap the whole time. But Elisha was being trained in helps. I want to do something for God. He already made his dedication way back there when he built, um, slayed those oxen in the middle of the field and offered them up to God. But he was trained in helps. Not this is ministry, you get behind the pulpit and you do this, this, and this. But he was trained to have a heart for God. I'm doing this for God. I'm going to be behind the scenes. And when Elijah passed on, and when I say passed on, we know he went up in the whirlwind. But when Elijah passed on, and that gap was left in the uh, hedges once again, there was somebody who ready to step right in. Someone who was there, who was in the trenches. Long before he was the man of God, he was Elisha the helper. He was Elisha the servant. Whatever Elijah needed done, that's what I'm going to do. When the sons of the prophets came to Elisha as they were getting ready for Elijah to pass on, what did they say? Do you know that God's going to take your master? They looked at him in regards of a servant. But there was a point in time when the master was taken that the servant took up the mantle and beat on the Jordan River and said, Where's the Lord God of Elijah? I've been trained in the helps. Lord, I've been willing to do whatever you want. But now, now you've selected me to stand where Elijah stood. I've always been the predecessor, but I was never in the limelight. I was only the helper. I did what was necessary. Maybe Elijah emptied the chamber pots, whatever it was. But there came a point when, all right, Elisha was ready to do what God needed him to do. Elisha was ready to be the man of God. And all those years that he had in training, being a helper, made him perfect for the position that he was ready for. And what was that? That was Elisha grooming somebody. That was Elisha saying, you know what, before you can do anything great for God, I shouldn't say before you can do anything great, but before you can be in the limelight, first you have to be where nobody really recognizes you. You have to do all those things that no one wants to do. Why? Because then you have a service heart. Ministry is all about being a servant. When it comes to leadership, it's all about being a servant. If you don't serve your people, don't expect them to respect you. If you don't serve and work for your people, don't expect them to work for you. But if you show your people, the servant leader, that you're willing to do whatever they're willing to do, if you're willing to get down in the trenches and do the worst of jobs and go beyond, I'll tell you what, you can raise up a following that they'll do anything for you. Other people, they might say, you know what, I'm not working for them because I've seen what they do. They stand up there, they do nothing. They're in a leadership position they don't do anything for this person. I'll follow them to the ends of the earth. Why? Because yes, they are my boss. But they've shown me that they're willing to do lower things than I'm willing to do. And because of that, I'll do whatever. You know what? Before we can be in ministry effectively, we need to realize that we are to be helpers. And if we can get the servant heart, then God can move us on to bigger and greater things. But it's not just us. We need to train the next generation. Because there's only one person we can control in this world. I realize that. That's me. The person looking back in the mirror. But man, if we can get a little on up, train up a child the way that he should go, and he will not depart in it. If we can instill in it in them from little on up to be a helper, man, the things that they can do for God. Not because they're looking for recognition, because it's never about recognition. Right. It's all about pointing to God. If you look at effective leadership, 
the person under the leader, everything they should do should be to make the person in charge look better. The supervisor, whoever's next up on the chair, chain, in a perfect world, everything they should do is to make the next person look better. And it goes on and on and on. The same thing's true in the church. When we are helpers, when we have a servant's part, we point up the chain. We make the pastor look good. But in reality, it's a matter of making God look good. You realize that there are a lot of Christians in this world, quote unquote, that are giving God a bad name. They really are. There are a lot of denominations that are giving God a bad name. But if we would just get back to the basics and say, Lord, not my will, thine be done. Lord, create in me not just a clean heart, but give me a servant's heart. Because I want to serve others. That is the helper's position in reality. Serving others. Cleaning the bathrooms. Picking up the trash. Making sure everything's in order. We're making sure the pastor looks good. We're making sure that the church, that the house of God looks good. We're making sure that God looks good. But if we want God to use us for bigger and greater things, first we need to be helpers. And God will take care of the rest. Because if we're willing to say, Lord, here am I, use me in whatever situation, you don't know what God's going to hold or not. But we need to make sure at the same time that we are raising up a generation of helpers. Because if it stops with us, it's not going to carry on. Plus, there are so many things as life goes on, if we would sit back and think, oh, I wish I could talk to so-and-so again so they could give me wisdom or guidance, and come right back to giving life guidance, let the elder women give life guidance to the younger women, and if we want to flip-flop, let the older men give guidance to the younger men. Because in the end, it's not about us, it's about God. And the Bible talks about leaving a legacy behind, and leaving a memorial rocks for the next generation to remember. What happens if you don't pass things on? They get lost. They get forgotten. Helps. It's not a popular topic because everybody wants a title. It's not a popular topic because not a lot of people want to get their hands dirty. And it's not a popular topic because, to be honest, there are things I've done that I really didn't want to do in the first place. I really, really do. You look at it, you see the situation. It's absolutely disgusting. But the reality is somebody's got to do it. Lord, here am I. Whatever capacity you need me, if we truly mean it, then we could be a great helper for God. And it's those great helpers. They might not have some great talents in their lives right now, but if they are serving God, they know the one who is the giver of talents. If they are serving God, they are the one that, that is serving the one who calls people. And God is the one who is looking for a people who are willing to do absolutely anything for him. And you don't know what God could do even through those little things. If we're faithful in the little things, God will make us ruler over much. The Bible talks about, he that is last shall be first, and he that is first shall be last. Nobody ever wants to be last in line. Nobody ever wants to be at the bottom of the pile. But I'll tell you what, God recognizes what you do for his church. God recognizes what you do for him. If you do it with a clean and pure heart, <laughs> They'll be, on Judgment Day, we'll be surprised on how many rewards some of the helpers get versus what some of the great big evangelists, televangelists, ministers got. Why? Because it came back to, we had a, they had a heart after God that said, Lord, I'm willing to do anything, even the most disgusting job on the planet, and they meant it with the heart. And because of that, God can use them in so many more facets of life and could do more through them than you could ever dream or imagine. I'm shutting up. Anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything they want to add? Sister Don. You know, where it says that older women teach the younger, I don't think that always means age. No. No, it's not necessarily because, because I, as an older person, even come to you for advice and help. Well, even
even when we look at that verse, uh, let the call for the elders to lay hands on the sick, it's not talking about the old men with the canes that are crippled. It's talking about men full of faith. It doesn't mention a specific age. It talks about so there is no age. People are different ages in Christ, regardless of this body. But it's a matter that we know where, I've always told people before, it's, it's not a matter of knowing everything, but knowing where to go for the information. And it's a matter for us coming back to being willing to let God use us in whatever capacity. And even when it comes to that, gleaning wisdom and knowledge in every direction. You know, there could be somebody younger than us that, man, they just have a heart after God, and God just has given them wisdom and knowledge way beyond their years. Look at Solomon. He didn't want fame, fortune, glory. He just said, God, give me wisdom and knowledge, wisdom to guide and lead your people. And with wisdom comes knowledge and understanding. And because of that, God granted him everything else with it. But... How old was Solomon when all this was done? You know, he was much younger than the eldest of people in his kingdom. So it's just a matter of knowing where to go for information as well. Sister Tina, do you have anything? Or? Yeah, um, you know, when we say train up a child, um, what I've learned over the years is that it's not just about the time that you're going to be investigation 
but the whole time she was in the background praying for him, leaving him notes, trying to pull him to Christ, knowing when to back off. To, but at the same time, she was constantly there trying to pull him. And it was not just his investigation, I'm sure, but it was her example that she was leading in that home to help win him to Christ. Because he said, if you, I think it's the case for Christ, where he made the statement that he noticed that there was something different about her and there was something different in the marriage. And it wasn't a bad thing, it was the complete opposite. And that's what sparked him to really lead his investigation. So you see that how it just goes hand in hand. Lord, it's not about me, but Lord, create in me a clean heart, create in me in the mind of Christ, and change me into your image, that I can be whatever you want me to be, wherever you want me to be. Because it's not just a matter of being willing in church, but outside of church. Maybe God wants to speak to something, to some, speak a word to somebody in the aisle. Maybe we never met them before. We don't know who they are. Maybe God wants us to go across the street to our neighbor. Who knows? But it's a matter of being a willing helper at all times. Because really, when it comes down to it, that's what we are. Christ's hands extended. We are his servant. Whether it's leadership ministry, whether it's being a helper in the church, cleaning toilets, it doesn't matter. Whatever our position is, and it should always be that we are a servant of Jesus Christ. And I'm wrapping up and closing so we can get in here and get started. Every, with every head bowed, gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below. That no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, and that the Holy Ghost may move as it so desires. Anoint the song leader and the musicians as they lead us in the songs you have us to sing. Give them a special blessing as well. Anoint the pastor's mind as it lives as we bring forth your word today. Anoint our minds and our hearts to receive your word with gladness. Remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that we would apply it to our hearts, Lord. And Lord, just take away all of the desires of our hearts, Lord. You said that the heart is deceitfully wicked, and we can know it, Lord. Lord, take away the desires of our heart, and give us your desires. Take away our heart, Lord, and give us your heart. Take away our mind, Lord, and give us the mind of Christ. Let our whole body, spirit, and soul be renewed today, Lord. Not just with the washing of the word, Lord, but with the washing of the Holy Ghost as he ministers, Lord, throughout the service, whether it be in song, whether it be in word, but even in our everyday life, Lord. May our spiritual ears be on call, that we may know your voice clearly, that we may hear it clearly, Lord, that we may grow, that we may truly say, whatever you have us doing, Lord, at whatever point in life, Lord, all we want to be is a servant of Jesus Christ. We want to be your servant, Lord. Whether it's in the limelight, whether it's in the back corner of the shadows where no one knows, Lord. Lord, let us be a willing servant for you, Lord. For it is not about us. It's all about you. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, hey, hey.